We would like to invite everyone to please rise and join us in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem, which will be immediately followed by our prayer. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. The afternoon session of our webinar episode commences now. Now, for our next resource speaker, we are welcoming Mr. Francis Esteban from the Far Eastern University. Mr. Francis M. Esteban is a faculty member and currently the chair of the Department of International Studies at the Far Eastern University. He finished his Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science at the University of Santo Tomas and took his Master's of Law in International Relations degree at Jilin University, Shangchun, People, PR, China. He is a steering committee member of the Philippine International Studies Organization and a member of the Philippine Political Science Association and the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies. He has published an article titled Philippine Foreign Policy Changes U.S. eviction in 1991 and the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement in the Korea Journal of Chinese Affairs. His research interests include Philippine foreign policy, Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-Philippine relations, and Northeast Asia relations. Once again, for his presentation on the diplomatic relations in East Asia before World War II, here is Mr. Francis Esteban. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office, I'd like, you, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this event for inviting me here and to share my presentation on the international relations of East Asia before the Second World War. My name is Francis Esteban, and I'm from the FEU Department of International Studies. So allow me to share my screen. All right, so again, uh, good day to everyone. I'm here to talk about the international relations of East Asia before the Second World War. Um, again, my name is Francis and I'm from the Department of International Studies of the Far Eastern University Institute of Arts and Sciences. And why do we actually have to talk about this? Why do we have to know or why do we have to understand what's happening in East Asia before World War II? Well, precisely for one reason is that what's happening before the Second World War, particularly in East Asia, eventually led to the events, the catastrophic events of the Second World War. So we're going to find out the events. We're going to find out the reasons, the, the, the motivations behind the countries, behind the empires in East Asia, and how it all fall into the Second World War. So let me give a very quick presentation outline. So first, of course, is we're going to talk about what it means or what does hierarchy and stability in pre-colonial East Asia means. 
After that, we're going to jump to the fall of the Chinese Empire or during the time of the Qing Dynasty, particularly that of the Hundred Years of Humiliation and the partition of China by major Western powers. And of course, by uh, Western powers, this already includes uh, Japan at that time. Then we're going to jump into Japanese militarism, the Meiji Restoration and the, the Japanese imperialism, which eventually led to what we call the military overstretch of Japan. Okay, so let's proceed. So hierarchy and stability in East Asia, particularly pre-colonial East Asia, before the European colonial powers started their conquest no, of, of non-European uh, territories, particularly also here in Asia. It has been argued that there is a relative peace compared to Europe here in East Asia no, during pre-colonial times. One particular theory about this relative peace is the fact that there is a hierarchical structure. No? Pag sinabi natin hierarchy, isa itong struktura kung saan merong isang entity, no? merong isang entity na nasa itaas ng structure na yun, and being at the top means that entity is somehow an overlord. No? Someone that ensures that there would be peace no? between the one at the top, and the tributary states or the lower states or the smaller states. No? China is at the center. No? Basically, it is China that is at the top of this hierarchy. Okay, So there are several reasons why China is like this. First, of course, is uh, geography. If you're going to look at the geographical location of China, it's, lit it's literally at the center, almost at the center of East Asia. Its vast accumulated lands also holds power. Its advanced civilization also holds influence over its tributary states. Kaya nga kung titignan ninyo, no, na ang tawag ng China sa sarili niya, no, the Chinese name for China is Chongguo, which when you literally translate means Middle Kingdom or Middle State. Now, the lesser states or those tributary states acknowledge China's dominance over East Asia at that time. And that acknowledgement, no, that, that acknowledgement that there is a hierarchy that exists leads to China not interfering with their domestic affairs. This comes in opposite with the usual assumption na pag merong isang dominanting entity, na pag merong isang dominanting estado, ay most of the time makikialam siya sa affairs ng mga maliliit o ng lesser states, no? The hierarchy and stability in East Asia is brought about by two factors. First is the fact that there is a hierarchical structure, someone at the top overseeing the peaceful relations with the tributary states, and the tributary states acknowledging that someone at the top. Okay, And in return, that acknowledgement, yung mga paminsan-minsan na pagkoto, no, tawag na na, pag koto o pag uh, acknowledge the power of the Chinese emperor would lead to China actually not interfering into the domestic affairs of those tributary states. Historical sources would see uh, uh, tributary states such as Vietnam at the time and Korea no, acknowledging the, in the, acknowledging the power, acknowledging the dominance of the Chinese emperor and with that, basically, there's very little interference no? na ginagawa ang China sa so domestic affairs sa mga bansa na ito. So there's a, relatively, there's a relative peace compared to what's happening in Europe at that time. No? Sa napakadaming gera at uh, conflicts over territories na nangyayari sa Europe. And all of this uh, stability, no? uh, relative, uh, mostly 200 years of relative peace, no? It all came to an end, no? or the start of the end, sabi nga nila, came when uh, the fall of the Chinese Empire, particularly during the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty, no? it is the last dynastic empire of China. Surprisingly, it's also one of the longest and most prolific uh, dynasty, uh, imperial dynasty in China. But it also saw the downfall of the Chinese Empire. And it is at this time, no, particularly in the latter years of the Qing Dynasty, that we saw how the Middle Kingdom 
China started its decline as well. And with it comes the relative peace na sinasabi natin noon, no? So, tingnan natin, ano nga ba? What caused, no, the fall of the Qing Dynasty and the Chinese Empire? So, the Qing Dynasty lasted from 1636 until 1912, no? But at the height of its power, it also saw a lot of other factors. Sorry, at the fall, no, at the fall of its power, no, at the fall of the empire, It saw a lot of reasons kung bakit nangyari yun. First, of course, is foreign invasion. At the latter years of the Qing Dynasty, we saw a lot of foreign interference into the domestic affairs of China already. No, We saw how European powers started to influence heavily and basically to partake, no? to have partitions in the land of China. So ano ba itong mga European powers? Ito? Of course, we saw... Uh, the colonial powers of Germany, Russia, France, to an extent even the United States, and at that time, at that unusual time, even Japan. So they were taking interest no, doon sa internal turmoil na nangyayari sa loob ng Qing Dynasty. And there were a lot of peasant rebellions and religious sectarianism that's happening and official corruption and of course a mismanaging of the flood Uh, in the Yellow River, no, one of the most uh, uh, significant rivers in China. So all of this contributed to the demise of the Qing Dynasty, no, and the demise of the Qing Dynasty in 1912. And it saw also a weakened China. It saw a weakened China, and what used to be at the top of the hierarchical order is now a weakened and lost China, no. Kung inyong napanood na yung pelikula na The Last Emperor, no? Yeah, it's a good movie. I recommend everyone to watch that movie, The Last Emperor. It shows the story of the downfall of the Qing Dynasty and how uh, China from an empire became a republic, no? Initially a republic. All right? Now, it begs the question. Ano na ngayon ang nangyari, no? Kung meron na nga or kung dati what keeps the hierarchy and stability in East Asia is a all-powerful China at the center, what happens now that there's no someone to keep that stability or there's no someone to actually navigate the waters of that stability? Okay? We'll jump now to our discussion of what's happening in the neighboring country of Japan. No? So... The Japanese, uh, uh, I mean, the power, no, the, the Japanese Empire, uh, the start of Jap Japan's power basically was through what we call the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration was a reaction to the isolationist policies of the former shogunate, the former Tokugawa shogunate. No, so what basically cost, no. Japan to open up. Because before the Meiji Restoration, Japan was a so isolated country. Now, it is because of several factors kung bakit nagkaroon ng katapusan sa isolation ng Japan. No? Uh, one of the dominant factor is yung sikat na sikat na uh, black ships ni US Commodore Machu Perry. So, sino ba si Machu Perry? He is a, uh, an American naval officer And he was the one sent by the U.S. president at that time to actually persuade Japan to open up its ports. Dalawang beses pumunta ng Japan si Commodore Perry. Una, para sabihin niya kay Japan, through friendly means pa to, ah, through friendly means, para sabihin kay Japan na it would be beneficial for both the United States and Japan to enter into trade negotiations. Because at that time, no, at the time of the Tokugawa Shogunate, no, It is only uh, Dutch. It's only the Dutch or the Netherlands that has commercial relations with an isolated Japan. So, unang punta ni Commodore Machu Perry, sinabihan niya si Japan, open up your ports. Let's have trade negotiations. Several months after or years after when Commodore Machu Perry went back again to Japan, dala na niya ang might ng U.S. Navy. And this was uh, infamously deemed as Machu Perry's black ships. And Japan saw that wala siyang match. Wala siyang match 
sa naval power ng United States, ng modern naval power ng United States at that time. So at that instance, it prompted Japan to actually open up its ports. And formally, uh, a treaty was signed between the United States and Japan, which is called the Treaty of Kanagawa, which highlighted the opening of several treaty ports in Japan and that the United States can, uh, can open a consulate in Japan. No? When the Tokugawa shogunate ended, what replaced it is the Meiji era. And the photo here is Emperor Meiji, no? the, the young Emperor Meiji. And uh, this era is famously called also as the Meiji Restoration. We're in Japan fully accepted now and fully embraced now an adoption of Western style of governance and military. So imagine from an era, from an era of extreme isolationism, Japan now accepted the fact that for it to develop, for it to further grow into its power, it has to accept Western style of governance, no? It created the national diet or assembly para magkaroon ng so-called democratic representation sa Japan and it adopted the modern and westernized style of military. Binitawa ng Japan yung centuries old niya ng, uh, ng uh, militarization through samurais and Japan adopted uh, military for conscription or conscription for military. Meaning to say, hindi mo kailangan maging nobility kasi dati, uh, before, Uh, during the time of the isolation period, it's only the nobles, no, mga noble persons, no, ang maaring maging samurai. Pero nung inadopt ng Japan ng Western style of governance and military, nagkaroon na tayo na tayo na conscription, no, that even though even those in the peasantry can be conscripted in the military. Japan realized, no, because of this, that it needs imperialistic ambitions. That to fully become a Western, uh, a Western style uh, country, it also needs to adopt Western style imperialistic ambitions. And now here we saw several Japanese imperialistic ambitions. No? Meaning to say, yung unti-unting pangunguwa na ng mga teritoryo ng Japan outside of its usual uh, territories. No? <clears throat> Excuse me. The very first one was in 1874. When Japan invaded the Ryukyu Islands, which uh, was supposedly originally uh, uh, controlled and uh, governed by or through China. So Japan acquired the Ryukyu Islands. And in 1876, it was now Japan that actually forced Korea to open its ports. And take note, Korea is under highly influenced by China. Diba sabi ko nga kanina, Uh, before pre-colonial times, Korea was a tributary state to China. And Japan saw it fit to force Korea to open its ports and to actually maintain a high influence in the Korean Peninsula. Now, because of this, syempre, hindi naman gusto ni China no, at that time, no, no, struggling na si China. Dahil ano na to eh, nakikita na yung downfall ng Qing, uh, ng Qing Dynasty, no? But it does not want to to uh, to give up that easily its influence over Korea. So in the 1880s, we saw a lot of Sino-Japanese rivalry over influence in Korea. No, merong mga uh, merong mga movements, domestic movements sa Korea that would want to uh, would want independence. No, uh, Japan supports the independence movements of the Koreans, while on the other hand, China supports. Those that would want to keep, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the Korean kingdom, you no, know, in its place. Now, eventually, you no, know, eventually, it was Japan that actually won over Korea, you no, know? and Japan saw it fit that its influence should not stop there in the Korean Peninsula, you no. Know? Nagkataon na malapit sa Korean Peninsula yung tinatawag nating Port Arthur, and at that time during 1904. Port Arthur was a ceded, no, was a ceded uh, territory of China to the Russians, no, to the Russian Empire. And for Japan, hindi lang sapat, hindi pa sapat na ang influence ng natin ay nasa Korea. So they marched on further 
support Arthur and actually attack no and actually attack the Russian defenses there and that eventually led to what we call the first Russo-Japanese war now take note there's something very peculiar no? there's something very uh kung sabihin niya natin ay bago dito sa Russo-Japanese war ano tong bago na nangyari dito what's new here is that it is the first time that the world saw a mighty European power, no? a mighty European power such as Russia, actually defeated by an Asian country, Japan. The world was really shocked that a country such as Japan at that time, which at that time scholars argue Japan is relatively weaker than Russia, yet Japan was able to defeat Russia, the first Russo-Japanese war. And this victory over Russia solidified Japan as an imperialistic power. Okay? As an Asian imperialistic power. It solidified Japan's ambition, Japan's imperialistic ambition. And it now further went on in 1908 with the formal annexation of Korea. Hindi na lang basta influence. Japan annexed Korea as part of its integral territory. And again, Japan did not stop there. Japan went on further in occupying Manchuria no? Man and further on northeastern China. All right, Further on even the entire northeastern China in 1931. And Japan did not stop there. It further went down China, through Southeast Asia, and eventually, no, what we saw is the Second World War. Okay? So, now, let's try to explain. How did Japan actually, uh, or why did Japan actually overstretch no? its imperialistic and military ambitions? The thing here is that we have to understand that Japan as a country has its interest. When China collapsed as a power in Asia, no, there was a power vacuum. There was a power vacuum and there was no one to actually balance uh, rising powers. Now, Japan being highly influenced by Western powers already, thought that there would be security through expansion. We have to understand that Japan does not have much resources. Walang masyadong natural resources ang Japan. It's an island nation. No? It's an island nation meaning to say uh, it's really hard for them to strive in terms of natural resources. And since it's heavily industrializing already, it needs raw materials and resources. So for them, no, they have to expand. They have to expand, particularly at the time of the Meiji Restoration, there are already talks of Japanese expansion. Because they think, or they thought rather, that security will be only attained through expansion. However, this is a myth. No? Some scholars would argue that security to expansion is just a myth and further on we'll realize that. Ano pa? Ano pang ibang dahilan ng Japanese military overstretched? Within the Japanese inner circles of government, mas naging prevalent yung mga highly militaristic advisors and highly militaristic personnel. For them, Japanese military, militarism and Japanese imperialism would justify they're staying in power. Furthermore, as Snyder in 1991 argued, it is Japan's quest for autarky. No? What do you mean to say by autarky? It means uh, uh, an economic system where it, it's self-sufficient. Japan wants to be self-sufficient. It knows that it has relatively fewer uh, natural resources than other countries. And to be self-sufficient, it needs to expand. It needs to occupy more land. Japan's limited resources 
prompting to occupy more land to sustain its existence. Imagine Japan as someone who is in a log. No? Isang tao na nasa isang troso. At para hindi siya mahulog doon sa troso na yon, kailangan niyang tumakbo ng tumakbo at paikutin yung troso na yon. Habang patuloy niyang pinapaikot yung troso na yon, no? unti-unti na napapagod din siya. Pero pag tumikil siya sa pagtakbo, mahuhulog siya doon sa troso na yon. Eventually, lead to its demise. That is what we call in international relations as log rolling. <clears throat> Basically, Japan is caught on a dilemma no? that it has to sustain its expansion through further expansion. Because if it will not expand, no, it will have no resources to sustain itself. And in the end, to even sustain mainland Japan. <clears throat> now, to think of it, was it actually, or in retrospect, was this a result of Western pressures on Japan? Come to think of it, would all this be in the mindset of Japan if not they were highly influenced by Western powers when they started to open up their ports no, to Machu, uh, to Machu Perry's black ships. Okay? And to conclude, no, we've talked that East Asia's relative peace and hierarchical structure is due to the fact that there is a dominant power. And this dominant power uh, is being recognized by the tributary states. And in return, the dominant power, which is China, does not really uh, interfere with the domestic affairs of those tributary states. However, Due to the fall of the Qing dynasty, we also saw, or we also saw, uh, saw the fall of China as that dominant power in East Asia. And it created a power vacuum for power and influence, which a highly industrialized and highly modernized Japan took a chance on. However, Japan's military overstretch became a necessity for its survival. Japan needed no? Japan needed that military overstretch to survive. Ironically, however, no, this led eventually to its demise at the end of the Second World War. Japan's military overstretch continued up until the Second World War. In fact, it's the reason why Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and entered the Second World War. U.S. oil embargoes no, to Japan because of its highly uh, militaristic attitude na nga eh. Because, you know, why did the U.S. Uh, did an oil embargo? Well, for the reason that uh, Japan is not stopping in its occupying lands in East Asia. So, U.S. had an oil embargo and Japan needed that oil embargo. And for Japan to get that oil again from, U, uh, from the United States, it has no more chance but to continue on overstretching and eventually proceed to a war with the United States. So it's ironic that Japan's military overstretch is a necessity for its survival, but it also eventually led to its demise at the end of the Second World War. And that concludes my presentation for today. That's a very brief introduction to the international relations of East Asia and how it all eventually led to the Second World War where we here in the Philippines was affected. One key takeaway that I want to share with uh, with you guys is that let's observe and let's learn from history. Are we actually seeing the events that led to the Second World War? Are we actually seeing something similar that is happening right now? I'm not saying that we are actually seeing, but I hope we can read the signs, we can read the patterns, no? And so that we can work things out para hindi na naman siya mag-lead sa isang napakalaki at napaka-destructive na gera. And again, thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, spending your time listening to this presentation. I hope there's something that you got. no. And uh, we're now open for your questions and I'll try my best to answer them. Once again, uh, this has been uh, the International Relations of East Asia before the Second World War. Thank you very much and have a good day.
Thank you very much, Mr. Francis and Esteban. For our last speaker for today, we have Mr. Luis Zuriel Domingo, a lecturer at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. Luis Zuriel C. Domingo is a lecturer of history at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in History at the University of Santo Tomas and at the verge of concluding his Master of Arts in History at the same university. Proactive in research, he is a student affiliate member and an early career researcher network member at the University of Sydney Southeast Asia Center and the London School of Economics and Political Science Sydney Hapsat Southeast Asia Center, respectively. He has presented and written works related to the history of nationalism in Southeast Asia, Philippine historiography, and pop culture. At present, he is working on his thesis project offering a detailed historical investigation related to the ratification of parity rights and the resurgence of post-war nationalism against foreign control of the econ economy in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Mr. Luis Zuriel Domingo. Good afternoon. My talk for today delves on many aspects like military history, political and economic histories, history of ideals, but most importantly, a panoramic view of global history before the Second World War, with the Philippines at the center stage. Looking back in various narratives and studies on global history of the war itself, the lens is always about international relations, strategic studies, and military history. In this talk, I want to highlight the Philippine Commonwealth's action concerning preparedness for a possible war with Japan. But preparedness is not only measured on military strength and strategies. Michael Beckley suggests that economic development is the most critical factor to affect a state or a nation's development of military power. In his study of various battles and wars from 1898 to 1987, he suggests that the more economically developed side consistently outfought the poorer side on a soldier-for-soldier -soldier basis. The Philippine Commonwealth was in dilemma in 1935. While it achieved political independence, the next step is economic independence. However, because of militarization of Japan and their expansionist campaigns in East Asia, national defense became the top priority of the Philippine Commonwealth. In his first address to the National Assembly, Kesson argued, quote, self-defense is the supreme right of mankind, no more sacred to the individual than to the nation, the interests of which are immeasurable, of great significance and extent. A threat against the nation involves not alone the life of one individual, but of millions. And to ask your ungrudging support for the establishment of a sound system of national defense, this is our first and most urgent need. But Kesson recognized and admitted that it's manifestly impossible with the state of the Philippine Commonwealth to acquire a naval fleet because of economic reasons. Politically, there was evidence of resistance in the act's passing, both inside and outside the assembly. Emilio Aguinaldo, for instance, expresses dissent and suggested relying first on the United States until the Philippines was granted complete independence. And the Commonwealth should prioritize solving the country's economic problems. Inside the assembly, the leading dissenter was Camilo Osias. As a champion of state support for education, he feared a militarization of young Filipinos and the Commonwealth's money and earnings should instead be spent on education and solving the country's problems like poverty and hunger. But the support for Quezon is formidable. Through the National Assembly, the Commonwealth Act No. 1 was signed and enacted in December of the same year, just 26 days after Quezon's inauguration. The Act's purpose was also known as the National Defense Act. It is to create an independent Philippine military. But as stated in Article 7, Section 16 of the National Defense Act, quote, the President of the Philippines shall have authority to appoint and maintain such technical advisors from the Army of the United States, unquote. Based on Japan's attitude before and during the interwar period and the United States' fear of a possible war, 
and the way I interpret the quick granting of the Tidings McDuffie Act of 1934 and the American support for the National Defense Act of 1935, it was an assurance that Filipinos are morally bound to defend the country in case of possible war in the Pacific and the national defense of the Philippine Islands is not solely carried upon the colonial responsibility of the United States. Although it was economically painful for the U.S. to give up the Philippines, it was the best strategy available militarily. National defense became a top priority, the economy only second to it through the Commonwealth Act No. 2, establishing the National Economic Council. Military historians would agree that as early as 1911, a possible war with Japan is definitely to happen. The question, however, is when. The Philippines, given its tactical location in the Pacific, the National Defense Act was precisely strategic and necessary for the U.S., but detrimental for the Philippines. Ever since the U.S. occupied the Philippines, our country became a magnet of aggression of whatever war is to happen in East Asia or Southeast Asia because of the growing and the clashing pan-Asianist sentiment and Western imperialism at the advent of the 20th century. But did Filipinos ever consider Japan a real aggressor before the war? It's pretty controversial. Following Japan's successive participation in wars beginning 1894 at the First Sino-Japanese War, quote, like any rising power, Japan was also developing an awareness of its national interests that lay far beyond its physical borders, unquote. Likewise, it was without a doubt why Bonifacio and the Katipunan sought political recognition and military help from Japan in 1896. In the words of Emilio Jacinto, Japan, quote, being the only nation in the Far East that could lend help to the Philippines in the same manner that France lent aid to the United States to secure the latter's independence, unquote. And, quote, that the light of liberty of Japan will also shed its rays in the Philippines, unquote. But when the U.S. acquired the Philippines, it had announced its presence in Japan's neighborhood. To understand the Filipino perception of the Japanese, we trace this back to the idea of pan-Asianism. This explains the dissenting opinion of some Filipinos to the Commonwealth's government's move to militarize the country to the National Defense Act. To begin with, Filipinos never regarded the Japanese as aggressors in the same way the U.S. considered them. Before the years of the Philippine Commonwealth, Filipinos had a casual yet frigid relationship with the people of Japan. Nicole Kounyeng Aboitis uncovered this in her book, Asian Place, Filipino Nation. Kounyeng Aboitis traced how, quote, the propagandists employed Japan as a symbol of current power to heighten by association the Filipino sense of their Asian civilization and Asian history, as well as to awaken national pride, unquote. This admiration for Japan was shared by different nations, not only of the Philippines, Vietnam, India, China, and Indonesia. It was not until Japan used Pan-Asianism to validate their military expansionism beginning in the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937 that some of these Asian nations had a fallout. Yet from the perspective of Japan, journalist Tokotomi Soho penned this as, quote, the countries of the Far East falling prey to the great powers of Europe is something that our nation will not stand for. We have the duty to maintain peace in East Asia, unquote. At first in the Philippines, the influx of migrants and immigrants in the islands was not seen as a threat by the Americans. The American government in the Philippines acquired the service of the Japanese, for example, in the construction of roads leading to Baguio. In Mindanao, many settled in Davao to work in abaca plantations. For the first time in Philippine migration history, the Japanese outlasted the Chinese immigrants. Many factors motivated the Japanese to migrate overseas, like overpopulation, rapid industrialization and modernization, and natural disasters. But the U.S. remained vigilant. From Western eyes, the migrations were considered internationalist plans of Japan's national development and imperial expansion, to the point that anti-Japanese sentiment in the United States and the Philippines became a national issue. 
But admiration of Japanese culture and political system were central in the 1920s among Filipino intellectuals. In the 1920s, Japan shadowed the erratic years of the Meiji and brought forth a democratic and liberal face. Its solid political, economic, and military institutions became proof of an oriental nation capable of overtaking or being in competition with Western nations. Some Filipino academics and politicians even considered Japan's political system as an example worth reviewing because it is the only oriental country to be modern and free from excessive Western influences. In a speech delivered before the Philippine Society of Japan in Tokyo, President Quezon assured that the future of Japan-Philippine relations, quote, Japan and the Philippines are neighbors, and it is to their mutual interest that they be friends. And friendship can only be promoted through fair dealing and justice on both sides, unquote. He also spoke about peace and cooperation. Quote, I am confident, in fact, it is my earnest endeavor that in the future there will be always be the heartiest cooperation between your people and my people in everything that means the progress and peace not only on this part of the world, but also of mankind in general, unquote. He even reiterated the allegations of the so-called Japanese problem in Davao were unsound and that the Filipino-Japanese relationship in Mindanao is nothing to be concerned about. Although not yet established, we can conclude that Pan-Asianism might be the reason why some Filipinos quickly cooperated with the Japanese during the Second World War. Some veterans of the Philippine Revolution welcomed the inception of the Second Republic in 1943. They have a common enemy, Western imperialism. But this premise, of course, takes further study and understanding. In another work, Kuunyeng Aboitis has entertained and interrogated this premise through her research of Jose P. Laurel's political thought which offered good observation related to nationalism and the concept of pan-Asianism in the context of the Philippines. Going back to preparedness with regard to the coming of the war, the Philippine Commonwealth exerted all effort in the reorganization of the Philippine Army beginning 1936. It is suitable to recognize Quezon's good decision to seek the help of General MacArthur and the Office of the Military Advisor to the Commonwealth Government to ensure the Philippines' national defense. While Filipinos have the experience of organizing their army, as best seen in the Philippine-American War, by 1935, the Philippines do not possess an independent army since 1902. For only a brief time, Filipino forces were organized for the First World War, but did not produce results and were later disbanded. The Philippines, therefore, have been reliant on U.S. troops in the Pacific. The country, however, was still in another dilemma. MacArthur projected that the Philippines would have a standing army of 400,000 by 1946. However, three years after the foundation of the Commonwealth Act No. 1, those who receive military training stand only less than 70,000. MacArthur's defense plan received doubts among Filipino politicians. This is one of many reasons why Quezon's Commonwealth produced executive order 230 of 1939, or the establishment of Department of National Defense. The said EO restricted American assistance and involvement in its formation of national defense. With EO 230, Quezon and the Secretary of National Defense have now full authority in its configuration and development of a Philippine army and its national defense. This is quite a bold nationalistic move by Quezon. Quezon and the Philippine Commonwealth started to be more independent and not rely on the United States. As Japan continued its expansionist campaign in East Asia and the Philippines with its reorganization of the Philippine Army, in 1939, President Quezon called on the Filipino youth, quote, quite a large sum considering the present condition of our finances is being spent every year in the execution of that plan but the government alone cannot provide an effective defense of our fatherland. Every Filipino citizen must be willing to make the supreme sacrifice when the call to arms is sounded. He further added, the schools, colleges, universities, public and private, 
must constantly instill in the minds and hearts of their students their duty to defend the nation in the time of war and to be useful and law-abiding citizens in the time of peace, unquote. But it was too late because of the many U.S. bases and significant presence of American fighters in the country, the Philippines still became the main target of Japan's coordinated invasion. Summing up, the Philippine Commonwealth faced many problems, from political to economic to military. Despite our leaders' confidence for self-government, the shared military responsibility with the United States in preparation for a possible war became one of the hindrances in the Philippine Commonwealth's path towards self-determination. Undoubtedly, the Philippines became the frontier of defense of the war in the Pacific in December of 1941. Whether it's the shortcomings of the Filipino leaders or our close ties with the United States or say Japan's ultra-nationalist goals, the Filipino people showed that despite ill preparation during the Commonwealth period, the valiant Filipino soldiers put up a fight that left a mark in our history that reverberates until today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Domingo. There you go. Thank you very much once again uh, to our speakers. We are now going to open the floor for the questions from the audience and the public. For our FB viewers, again, please place your questions on the comment section. And for the Zoom participants, please place your questions on our chat box. And please indicate as well as to whom you would like your questions be addressed. And with that, we are requesting our four uh, speakers for today. So please turn your respective cameras on, Mr. Francis Esteban, Mr. Luis Duriel Domingo, uh, Dr. Archie Direto. There you go. Please turn your cameras on. Po. Okay, so for our first question, for our first question for Dr. Albella, was there a recorded increased animosity between the Chinese and Japanese communities in Davao when the Second Sino-Japanese War started? Was there a recorded increased animosity between the Chinese and Japanese communities in Davao when the Second Sino-Japanese War started? This is for Dr. Albella po. Uh, sorry, medyo hindi ko. Was there any... Recorded increased animosity between the Chinese and Japanese communities po in Davao when the Second Sino-Japanese War started? Animal? Ano? Animosity po. <laughs> ah, animosity... <laughs> Sorry. So, ano eh. Uh, animosity. Uh, was there any animosity between yes. the Chinese China? and the Japanese po? In uh, well, as for that, uh, it's not actually the coverage of my discussion, but based on the uh, many uh, books on history, there were few, but uh, we still have to explore that area. But uh, if we're going to look at it, it's very natural to have that. So uh, that's my answer for that uh, question. Thank I you. hope I answered it. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Paul. Okay, next question. This is from uh, Reno, from one of our Zoom participants. This is for Mr. Esteban. Now, sir, can you discuss Japan's relation with the Western powers and the impact of the League of Nations? Nations, rather. <clears throat> Right. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, well, Japan's relation with the we with the Western powers at that time, in, in which particular uh, period are you uh, referring to? Uh, before the war, Japan had a dynamic relations with Western powers. Uh, one can look at the example at uh, Japan's relationship with the Russian uh, with the Russian Empire, no? That uh, uh, was uh, really tarnished by what happened during the Russo. Uh, Japanese war. No? And uh, regarding the impact of the League of Nations, particularly I would say that uh, the League of Nations was not really significant, if I may say, no? to, to, to an extent that it actually uh, failed to deliver and it eventually uh, ceased into existence no? because of uh, you know, the United States proposed this idea, but ironically it was the United States that also did not join this uh, League of Nations due to congressional uh, opposition, the League of Nations. 
Okay, thank you very much, sir. Next question, po. This would be uh, for Sir Dr. Abel again. The Japanese sent agents in the Philippines, especially in the Davao region before the war. In the present context, we have an influx of Chinese workers in our country clustered together in the southern area of Metro Manila. Should we be alarmed on this matter, sir? I, I think that question is very familiar. Uh, yes, that's actually the point of my presentation. Because at that time, as we can see, you know, there's there was an influx of Japanese population for no reason. But if you're going to look at the world context, they're actually starting to dominate. So uh, with that, siguro sa akin, ang mapapayo ko lang, uh, since we're, we're now experiencing this kind of influx also, now this time for the, uh, the Chinese uh, immigrants. And uh, before the pandemic, I think there were so many pogo stations established in the country, right? So uh, it, it's not that I'm saying that, uh, you know, we, we have to react right away. No, uh, we have to be ready at least or observe that and make that as uh, a warning for us that we have to be uh, careful this time because it happened <laughs> during the time of the Japanese. So... Uh, in that case, uh, I would like to uh, at least uh, tell this to the government that we have to be observant with that situation because it might happen. Because if we're going to look at it now, China is now becoming a superpower country. So, meron tayong tinatawag na parallelism at that point. So, I, I uh, in my case, in my opinion, I think it's about time for us to look at that aspect. I hope I answered the question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay, thank you, Paul. Next question is for Sir Archie. Uh, or Dr. Uh, yes, Sir Archie. Can we attribute westernization as one of the reasons why Japan became an imperialist nation? I can say that uh, westernization might be an intended consequence to that. But apparently, if we are going to look at the general early history of Japan, you can see that there is a very strong embedded concept of divine superiority where they would expand later on in their early mythological literary works like the Kojiki, which they published uh, around uh, 712. Another one was the Nihon Shoki or the Chronicles of the Japan, which tells us about the mythological origin that they came from the sun god Izanagi and Izanami. And the imperial lineage of Japan, starting, of course, with the first emperor in uh, 660 BC of February 11 under Emperor Jimo Tenu, would come directly from the lineage of divine, superior, semi-human uh, lineage. And so this might have been contributory to their kind of expansionist program later on that during the San Francisco Treaty, the Americans would also find it quite hard to remove that uh, concepts in many of the Japanese textbooks that they belong to the uh, the superior race and anything that goes beyond that, for example, the, the other civilizations are considered to be lesser for the Japanese. And also, uh, well, with that kind of mindset, you see how they were able to prop up the powers of the emperor under Hirobumi Ito in 1889 with the development of their uh, constitution empowering the emperor not only to become sacred and inviolable, but the emperor was also given uh, supreme power declaring war, uh, of course, without the consent of the imperial diet, the provision of all the honorary titles as the emperor would wish to give, and also the expansion of the, the imperial uh, domains in many parts of uh, East Asia, as what Mr. Esteban said a while ago, no? yung uh, militaristic and uh, expansionist program was done by the Japanese uh, simply because of that uh, uh, divine fair board that were given to them. When the Americans came in uh, around 1945 and they tried to remove these kinds of influence in the mindset of the Japanese, the first thing that they did was to remove all of these legendary textbooks that were considered to be part of their historical underpinning. So they had to remove all these textbooks. They orient all their values 
the patriarchal uh, male dominated values of the Japanese. Women were given rights to vote. And uh, with that, they, they were able to develop themselves. Uh, even the economic aspects during the time of the Japanese were controlled by a few financial cliques that were also emboldened by this divine superiority notion. They were the Saibatsu, and most of these family members, Mitsui family, Mitsubishi family, and the Sumitomo family would finance the wartime campaign. So yung tanong kanina, babalikan ko lang, uh, is it really uh, the westernization, not necessarily the westernization, but of course the mindset that they have, plus of course it was uh, uh, developed by the adoption of the, Amestica, uh, the American or the Western technological advancement that laid the foundation for the creation of a greater East Asia for prosperity sphere. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now uh, we ask this question to uh, Sir Domingo. Given that you consider the strategic location of the Philippines, would it not be inevitable that it would be a target of aggression regardless of the American military presence, sir? Um, like I said, I'm not very um, well-versed with strategies and the history of the Second World War. However, um, we can see now we could have lessened the damage here in the country without the, Mer the American bases. You see, as early as 1911, there were already, say, defense projects by the Americans in the country. So the idea is they want to make the Philippines the shield before going before bringing the war to the Pacific, into Hawaii and to the shores of the United States. So they really, so rapid uh, development of this defense system. So without that kind of defense system, we could have lessened the damage here in the country. You see, compared to other Southeast Asian countries, mas mabigat yung force ng Japanese here in the Philippines. And I think military historians can attest to that uh, uh, assertion na mas grabe yung forces na dinala sa atin compared to other Southeast Asian countries. And you see, the Philippine government cannot make a decision by itself. Despite the Commonwealth government, given the transition period already, we have to um, depend on the decision of the United States, especially to General MacArthur. So Quezon, you see Quezon, um, kailangan din niya dumepente. So, so ano decision kay MacArthur and what Washington gives to MacArthur? Okay, po. thank you very much. Next, po, to uh, Mr. Esteban, prior to the event of the fall of China's dynasty, did the Japanese already uh, see a potential economic relationship with the Philippines that later on became the cause of the diplomatic relationship between Japan and the Philippines? Okay, so you, uh, the question is about prior to the fall of the Chinese dynasty. Well, if we're going to talk about the prior, prior to the fall of the Qing dynasty, to be more specific, mm -hmm. Uh, Japan was in isolation. You know, Japan maintained this uh, principle, this uh, doctrine of I isolationism. No, and that's why uh, it was really uh, uh, shocked and nagin uh, sa pagsubok natin uh, na wintang ano talagang nakita niya yung mga black ships ni Matthew Perry. No, so uh, uh, I, I, I'm I'm not a historian to talk about more on the history of Philippine. Uh, Japan relations prior to the fall of the Qing dynasty, but I I would I can say that at that time no prior again I'll emphasize I, I put emphasis on prior to the fall of the Qing dynasty, which means prior to the arrival of uh, Machu Perry's ships, Japan was in isolation and uh, uh, at uh, very few um, foreign relations ng Japan very restricted. In fact. Uh, I think uh, it is only the Netherlands, uh, the only Western country at that time that can access trade, no, in the uh, trade and commerce with uh, Japan. Okay, po, thank you, po. Now this question is uh, to uh, address to all of our speakers. So, with the current technological advancements during our time, this information is very rampant. Now, something that can also be seen in other countries are conspiracy theories. Now, do you have any idea about why uh, they choose to misinform and how do you think should this be generally solved? So this is about uh, misinformation. So, uh, Sir uh, Francis Esteban, you can start off. Okay. Uh, well, 
the question is uh, how do we avoid or why do people choose to be misinformed but in a way i think it's somehow very uh very far from the topic that we're actually discussing but to just give an idea and you know share my own uh thoughts on that well people choose to be misinformed because you know it takes time to learn <laughs> diba? it takes time to learn it takes effort to learn it, 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 it in fact it, i would even dare say that at this time it takes courage to learn so people would choose to be misinformed because sometimes it's the easiest way for them to have information so how do we battle or how do we fight misinformation we give correct and accessible uh, factual based information because as i um, as vague as i um, as uh, as uh, hindi man maganda pakinggan no pero matiyaga kailangan ng tiyaga para matuto at minsan yung pagiging matiyaga ay sa pag uh, para matuto ay minsan nagiging luxury na sa iba nating kababayan kaya siguro pinipili na lang din na maging misinformed Any insights, Sir Albella? Yes, sir. Regarding the misinformation. The question is with the current technological advancements during our time. Ba? Misinformation is very rampant. Uh, I would like to answer that first sentence. In fact, kahit wala pa nung technological advancements na yan, since the time of immemorial, meron ng misinformation. Because it serves its purpose. We all know, okay, from uh, our histories, uh, even before and until now, okay, kahit itong Philippine-American war, ang dami niyan. Uh, even the Americans, uh, they produce yellow journalists because they have to write something, okay, an information that will cuddle the government and the rest of the, uh, the members of the Congress to pass the Treaty of Paris. You know, this misinformation, hindi mawawala yan. Okay? It's always there because... Uh, that's what we call propaganda. Okay? And propaganda serve always its purpose. At ano yun? Okay? To, to uh, bring the, uh, the people, okay, believe on them and support them so that at the end sila yung lalabas na tama. Ngayon, what, uh, ano sabi dito? Do you have any idea about to choose to? Ganito yan. Uh, it's very easy to, so, to solve this thing. Uh, in the age of uh, technology right now, okay? The technology is somehow uh, very good. Uh, I don't know in the Philippines no, because the internet is so bad. But anyway, uh, dapat ginagamit natin yung tinatawag natin na technology din. Okay? To research. Okay? And then at the same time, to look for the validation. We have to be vigilant on all the information that we got from the, especially in Facebook, so, uh, other social media uh, avenues. Kasi itong mga ito, minsan, wala naman itong mga citation, eh. wala naman itong mga references. Eh. Diba? Hindi ka agad-agad ganun. Not unless kung yung nag-post, eh, may, meron siyang ready reference for that. But uh, at the age of the uh, technology, we shall use also the technology to advance our research. Research is actually the, the answer for that misinformation. That's why uh, in, the, in the country, okay, uh, nag advocate ako yung parang, kasi tayo sa academic, ano ba, kami sa academic, no? it's very easy for us to say, hey, it's research, no? the solution for the misinformation. It's very easy to say that. But when you go to the streets, you go to the balot vendor, the cigarette vendor, etc. Paano nila marilich yun? That's why uh, most of the time, if some of you already noticed me in other other webinars and conferences before, binababa ko yung language. Eh. Okay? Binababa ko yung wika. And uh, I always make it a point that I, uh, you know, I devise some, uh, you know, words, vocabularies, choice vocabularies para ma-encourage din yung mga simpleng tao na nakakausap natin, you no, know, kabawa sa jeep, no, kabatihan tayo, nagkangitian kayo, gaya. para makausap natin sila na there's uh, a lot of ways now because of technology na pwede nating inform yung sarili natin. Uh, that, I, I think that uh, that could be the uh, the answer for that. I hope I answered the question. Salamat. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, would you like to add anything, sir, Reso? Dr. Reso? I consider information and misinformation a power, and we consider that an edge in any battle 
what Machiavellian and Sonsi would always tell that uh, deception is considered to be an art in any warfare. Well, uh, providing information is good because uh, it gives us an edge in any battle. But he, according to Sonsi, who masters this information, and he who is able to utilize deception usually wins the battle. The Japanese did use that during the time of their annexation of uh, Southeast Asia. They, they were trying to, to inform the Americans that it would be possibly the Philippines first and then Singapore or perhaps Hong Kong. But they bombarded Pearl Harbor unknowingly on the part of the United States because of this disinformation campaign. Um, I would consider that something that is very powerful right now. It is being used by many nations. Uh, it's good to have information and we are, it is being carried by the information super highway, but we also have to look at that aspect that the Machiavellian and the Sonsi's art of deception is still very useful nowadays in any battles that you can see, Ukraine versus Russia, the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, even the, the local battles that we have between the Philippines and the Americans has always been carried on by this information. Pretend that you are weak. Well, in fact, you are very strong. Pretend that you, you do not know anything, but in fact, you are now knowledgeable about the subject matter. So uh, I think that's how it is being utilized right now uh, in many nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rezos. And lastly, po, Sir Domingo, anything to add? Uh, I think it's up to where we access this, this kinds of information. Because access is very important. Uh, right now, because dahil madami misinformed, we have Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube. These are not um, regularly regulated or walang system to regulate the information in there. And, um, even kahit lahat na sa internet, eh, uh, titignan mo pa rin kung totoo ba talaga information. I think it's, it's about access. Kaya mas madaming nami misinform nowadays. And like what Dr. Reza said and Dr. Alberta said, it's very powerful if the information serves its purpose. And talagang ang propaganda, kapag um, kumalat yan ng, sa isang tao lang, kakalat kakalat talaga yun sa napakadami. So I think these big companies, uh, I will more I will uh, attack more on the big companies that are controlling the internet right now. They have the uh, duty to regulate all this information dapat. Sila yung, hindi na sa tao yun eh. um, It's not your... Say, um, hindi mo pagkakamali kung misinformed ka. Hindi din uh, mali kung ikaw nag-share ng something sa Facebook or sa Twitter about misinformation. Dapat pa lang sa mga platform, it should be regulated already. If this is true, uh, nafa-fact-check na agad before uh, kumalat siya. Sila na mismo dapat yung nagko-control sa mga gandong bagay. Yun lang yung masasabi ko with, uh, with misinformation. Yan. Thank you very much for our speakers. Indeed po, we have to be responsible po sa information na pinipid sa atin ng ating mga social media. And that's very important po, especially sa ating younger uh, participants, ating young participants, mga students. So that's very, very helpful po. Thank you po. Uh, we'd like to uh, have another question po from John Edson Marasigan po for Sir Domingo. Are there African Americans who served in the U.S. Army in the Philippines during World War II? Uh, like I said a while ago, I'm not an expert on uh, the Second World War and in military history, and this is very uh, demographic, so I have no answer to this. But I believe during the Philippine American War, there were Black American soldiers who served under the Americans, and this is a very interesting topic. Na hindi pa well explored on how these Black Americans uh, felt, felt during the war. Because uh, we were treated as sabi na natin Blacks also, or say the word, use the word um, niggers. So habang sila, ginagamit sila ng mga white Americans to say wage war to us. So there were conflicts actually with regard to how they were used by the white Americans during the Philippine American War. This is a very interesting uh, topic to explore on. Uh, so I asked the question. Maybe you can look at this uh, part of our history. And because during the Second World War, the Filipinos were also serving the Americans. 
So there was no conflict with the Black Americans and with us compared to... Um, actually, the conflict is in our side now because we are battling the Japanese who are also Asians and we considered ourselves as also as Asians. And like I mentioned during my talk, um, nakita natin si Japan before as a symbol who will help us with regard to our self-determination. Mas nakita nating symbol si, si Japan during the 19th century compared to the United States until nagkaroon na ng shift with uh, the pan-Asianist um, concepts. All right, thank you so much for that, Sir Domingo. Thank you, sir. Now, next one, this is from Jose Maria Torres. This is for uh, Dr. Albella. Are there still modern-day descendants of these Japanese residents in Davao still living in the Philippines today, even though some of them died or were deported to Japan after the war? Parang may sagot na doon, ah. Oh, na deport na, pero... Hindi, pero to answer uh, the question seriously, ito serious ako. May mga tinatawag tayong ano, Nikkei Jin. No? Nikkei Jin. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that. No? Yung Nikkei Jin, yan yung mga second generation Japanese na mga inanak. O, bali anak pala, hindi inanak. Uh, na anak na eh. So, anak ng mga na iwan dito mga hapon uh, before and during the Second World War. In fact, uh, may notes ako dyan eh. Teka lang. Ay, ito. Okay. This is actually, I got this from my class before sa Japanese under Dr. Rezos. <laughs> Siya ang teacher ko noon. <laughs> si, ang Nikkei Jin may tatlong categories yan. Kasi nagkaroon nung 1995 ng... Uh, Uh, what do you call this? Parang uh, survey. There, there was a survey in 1995 done for this uh, for the so-called second generation Japanese. Ang mga Nikkei Jin, after the survey, I think uh, they were categorized into three. There's category A, category B, and category C. Now, the uh, the category A, uh, ang maganda dito sa category A kasi, uh, meron silang tinatawag na citizenship. So for them, it's no longer a problem no, to go back to Japan, uh, live another life there, whatever. But the, uh, the problem now is on the, uh, the category B and category C. Because most of the uh, Japanese, second generation Japanese or Nikkei Jin, uh, itong nasa category B and C, uh, they were actually uh, uh, fathered by a Japanese. Kaya lang... Uh, ang pinagkaiba si B na locate nila okay. kaso namatay na yung sa category C hindi na nalocate so mas ma mas mahirap yung pinagdadaanan ng C because they have to prove that they were fathered by a Japanese okay so in that case nakipagtulungan ang Japan we already ha uh, had this I think that was uh, ano pa lang ang pinaka current yung 2020 2021 may mga lawyers na nag volunteer here Japan sa sa Japan and then they went in the Philippines to ask the government to cooperate with them and take uh, take care of the uh, the situation of the categories uh, BNC yung mga buhay pa. In fact, uh, as of 2021, may mga figures tayo diyan. Ah, uh, wait lang. Ito. Uh, sa mga na trace nila over uh, over 1000 yun, no. Ang alive is sa uh, More or less, mga nasa 220, 29, 30, hanggang 30. Tapos sa categories, yung mga buhay pa nasa 400 plus pa. So with that, okay, they're working on the Japanese citizenship. Okay, so that this second generation Japanese Nikkei Jin can go back to Japan and uh, live, uh, you know, a prosper, uh, prosper, uh, prosperity and uh, kung ano pa. Kaya lang kasi ang mahirap dito, matatanda na sila. Most of them are now in their 80s. Okay. Uh, yung iba mga ano pa 70s so but they're still hoping no kasi ang ang tawag sa kanila ang ang nahirapan dun sa sa part na dahil wala nga silang citizenship ay tinawag silang mga stateless people although uh, they can uh, they can be identified as Japanese but of course no? may mga legalities kasi pinag-uusapan pero yun uh, to answer the question yes may mga may mga ano tayo dito uh, uh, nabubuhay pa 
na second generation Japanese na inanak ng mga tumira dito before the war and during the war. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arbella. Now, this is from John Emmanuel Velasquez. This is for Mr. Zuriel Domingo. I would like to know how did Southeast Asian revolutionists and pan asianist figures from Vietnam and Philippines reacted upon learning that Japan began to expand southwards and conquer their homelands in 1941? Uh, very interesting question because I said a while ago, as early as um, mid um, to late, 19th century, we have many uh, revolutionaries in, in Tokyo and in Yokohama. They stayed there because uh, they seek refuge there and during also at the turn of the century. Na, nakita nila na Japan became a symbol that can free them from Western imperialism. And there's actually a fallout to all the Pan-Asianists and to all this revolutionary in in Japan. Actually, before that, during the Philippine-American War or during uh, the Philippine Revolution, nakita nila naging symbol pa yung Philippines as a best an example. We have the Chinese revolutionaries who observed the revolution here in the country. Then the Indians, uh, all kinds of um, Pan-Asianists, Asians don't, who are seeking um, independence also. Uh, isa lang kasi kalaban nila eh, during that time, which is Western imperialism. However, nagkaroon ng fallout nung nakita nila na Japan is turning to be that kind of imperialist na during the turn of the century. And uh, maganda explore pa tong topic na to. Maybe we, uh, Pan-Asianism can answer why many collaborated with the Japanese. Why uh, many um, hated the Americans prior to the Second World War. Why many also um, cooperated, uh, like I said, um, collaboration. Why many cooperated. Because very fresh pa the Philippine Revolution during the 1940s. And napaka-fresh pa ng Philippine-American War. We have these enemies who, con who conquered us, independent na tayo by 1898, then inanex tayo. And bigla sila magiging kaibigan natin. So you have these many uh, sentiments during the 1940s why some Filipinos also cooperated with the Japanese during the Second World War. With the Vietnamese... Uh, I can't answer this specifically because their top revolutionary, Si Phan Pho Cha, died in 1940. So we don't know what happened. But during the late 19th century, very hopeful din siya with Japan to help Vietnam against the French. Pero sabi niya then, according to studies about him, na wag din tayo magtiwala gaano kay Japan. We can use Japan to free us from the Western imperialists. But nakita kasi nila yung pag uh, katulad ng mga sabi ng sa talks ni Dr. Resos and ni Professor uh, Francis Esteban din na nag-grow din kasi yung Japan at the turn of the century so they have to be say cautious on trusting Japan during those uh, period Okay po, thank you very much so I think this will be our last Question po, if wala nang pahabol. Now, this is from Rino Francisco. Considering their importance to the Japanese Navy, were, there, uh, were the abaka exported to Japan? I think this question is for uh, Sir, Sir S7. Sorry, uh, can you repeat uh, yes, the question? Sir. Yes, well, the question, sir, is considering their importance to the Japanese Navy, were the abaka exported to Japan? Okay, uh, as much as I would like to share an answer to that, but uh, again, I'm, I'm not a historian. Uh, my expertise is on international relations. No? So uh, international relations of East Asia for that uh, matter. So uh, I'm sorry, I, do not, I, I have no idea and I'm as much as uh, enthusiast to know if there are, or if there were at that time. Yes, sir. It's okay, sir. Uh, uh, I, think, yes. I think the question is for me. Because it's not a Very keen listener. Yung, ano. The question is for me, I think. Uh, because I mentioned about the Abaka, the two major plantations of Abaka that's established by Furukawa and Oto. Kusubo, di ba kanina? Uh, the question, uh, if I may recall, 
may nag-export ba itong plantations na ito? Lalo na yung Furukawa, lumaki yun eh. Uh, sa Japan. Uh, you have to remember, as mentioned by Dr. Rezos on his presentation, that the uh, the purpose, one of the purpose of the Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere is to enjoin all Asian nations to support Japan's cause. Economic, political, militarily, marami. At kasama na doon yung socio-economic. Kasi, nag-embargo nga eh. Diba? Nag-impose ng embargo ng United States. Oil, scrap metal, etc. Ngayon, before the war, before pa yung mga embargo na yan, okay, they have, when they uh, saw now the the uh, the Dabao, Dabao ko, Dabao ko, uh, potential uh, for the needs of the Japanese as they you know strengthen their uh, military uh, citizenship etc okay. yes okay we have so many records na ito mga plantations aside from their personal economic gains they're also supporting uh, the Japan's cause uh, because that would help Japan especially you no know, during the embargo okay in fact, hindi lang yung nandito na mga hapon, hindi lang yung, ano yan, eh, hindi lang abaka na. Nagano pa, nag-expand pa. Uh, naganap sila ng plantation ng uh, cotton for Japanese uniforms. Okay? Naganap din sila ng mga plantations for uh, rice, corn, etc. Pinalaki din nila yun. Because uh, the, the purpose of that is to support the cause of Japan in the war. Because at the very first uh, scenario, after the Pearl Harbor attack, um, yung hindi, kasi yung atake na yun, if I can remember again, no, may, uh, may class, uh, when I was still a student, uh, hindi nga natuwa dun yung, ano, after the Pearl Harbor, tama ba ako, Dr. Archie, hindi natuwa yung, ano nila, kasi, hindi natupad yung target. So with that, uh, dahil hindi nakita yung mga Japanese ay uh, yung mga US carriers na yan hindi yan na, napasabog ng mga Hapon doon pa lang na, na ano na sila uh, nanginig na sila na we have to use this co-prosperity sphere to support our economic needs so kung ang tanong ay may mga records ba yes there were records but it has uh, yet to explore okay uh, by uh, the future researchers Pagka nagkaroon ulit siguro ng pagkakataon, if I can uh, visit the National Library, the UST Library, and other libraries, okay, uh, gusto ko makita yung, yung records na yun. Pero I, I saw one before. Okay. So that's it. I, I hope that I uh, answered the question. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Albala. Now, this is for uh, everyone po. Prior to invading the Philippines in December 1941, did Imperial Japan collected over time enough intel that they can successfully conquer the Philippines despite the significant American military presence? Let me just repeat it again. Prior to invading the Philippines in December 1941, did Imperial Japan collected over time enough intel that they can successfully conquer the Philippines despite the significant American military presence? Mauna na ako, alphabetical order. Mauna na ako. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Sir, sir, ba nilo? Kamusta? Ayan, no? US DL Ayun data. Ayun po, ayun niya. Ayun po. Uh, sige po, sir. Sige po, sir. Kung gusto niyo pa. Alphabetical tayo. Ako na. Uh, ang tanong ay kung nakala, nakakuha ba sila ng enough intelligence report? Uh, not that much, pero it's already enough. Okay. I, I think I mentioned that in my presentation na meron talaga mga nakasahin na mag-spy. Ang ano nga eh, ang the thing, pag nabasa niyo yung libro ni Dr. Dibiana, yung Halo-Halo Hardware, di ba? yung panahon ng mga businesses dito ng mga hapon. I mentioned that also in my presentation na may mga businessmen talaga no? na kaling sa Japan, pinapunta sila dito, magtayo ng business. Yung iba naging peddlers. Okay. Yan si, si Maria, no? example yun. Ah, uh, ang tanong ay kung enough, yes. Okay? Enough na 'yon for them. Okay? Although uh, hindi siya fully developed na information na talagang package, no? Sa case ng Philippines lang, I am speaking in the case of uh, Philippines particularly in Davao, no? Although hindi siya ganoon ka 
kadami pa but it helped already the Japanese okay, to mobilize in fact when they attacked the Philippines they knew already where, where to attack okay. sinimulan kagad nila north you have the uh, the Batanes there and then you have the south at so ang nangyari diba paano sila Caesar attack kung tawagin no sa strategy the Caesar attack and then they met they uh, they met each other in Manila kaya mas madaling na invade ng Pilipinas because they already uh, surveyed everything tapos ang una nilang uh, binanatan dito na survey na nila ang ganda ng survey nila okay mas maganda to sa ano sa SWS ang pagka survey nila uh, alam ka agad nila kung sino yung patatamaan for example the Clark Air Base yun kagad ang ano sabay sa uh, sabay sabay yung inatake nung uh, kasi kaya ako naalala yon because uh, my grandfather was based in Clark at that time and then uh, my grandmother sa sa father side naman nag uh, si celebrate nag pesta yun eh uh, immaculate conception pesta yun nag ano sila parada akala nga nila ano lang yung exercise di ba ng mga Amerikano kaya lang nung may hapon kasi doon eh. Pero may, may hapon silang kasama sa biglang sumigaw, tura, 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 gumaganan daw. So, ibig sabihin, hindi na Amerikano yun. <laughs> hapon na. So, uh, they carefully surveyed the area. And when they attack, kaya mas mabilis sa kanila nakapasok. Uh, not that enough, but it's already enough. Okay. Para maka-atake sila. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I may know na, Uh, I would agree with what uh, Dr. Albela said that uh, it was enough already for Japan. Because remember, uh, in my presentation a while ago, uh, I, I would argue that intel or intelligence about uh, the, the strategic position of uh, military armaments of the Ameri- or mili- military presence, hindi na to, uh, hindi na to ganun ka... Uh, ganun ka should I say halaga sa iniisip ng Japan nun because this is already military overstretch as what I've mentioned a while ago and when we say military overstretch I gave that analogy of imagine someone no, in international relations we call it log roll log rolling imagine someone in a log no someone trying to run on that log and for him not to fall on that log he, he has to keep on running so this is also the same uh, uh, this is this can be a metaphor to what Japan Uh, did in the Second World War that it needs to go further beyond to extend or to have those resources. It needs to feed its war efforts. So, yun niya. So, para sa kanila, sapat na kung ano yung intel na nandun pa na nakuha nila. Pero more than that is uh, it needs to conquer. You know, it needs to pursue a military overstretch. Kasi if it would stop there, you know, if it would stop there, it cannot anymore or the lands that it has acquired will not be sufficient to feed the, the the war machinery of Japan. So yeah. Would you like to add anything Dr. Resort? There's real. You know the uh, Tanaka doctrine which has been rumored to have circulated in the early 1930s by Prime Minister Giichi Tanaka. In order to conquer the world, it is necessary to conquer Asia first. In conquering Asia, you need to conquer China first. In conquering China, you have to take over Mongolia and Korea first. Everything was uh, explained already by Mr. Esteban a while ago. You have already taken the Ryuko Group of Islands in 1874. You have agreed with the Treaty of Kangwa in 1876, thereby Korea was freed from uh, its uh, isolationism by the Japanese imperial government. You have the signing uh, of the Treaty of Shimonoseki in 1895, and thereby you have almost taken parts of uh, uh, northeastern uh, China, including the uh, area of Taiwan and Penghu. And then you have in 1910, supposedly the annexation of Korea. Um, China was placed under the 21 commands. They have a president at that time, Yuan Shikai. And Yuan Shikai was influenced already by the Japanese. 1931, you have the Mukden incident. And finally, in 1937, you have the rape of Nanking and the China incident. What more do we need to know if they are prepared or not? They have already taken the entire Asian continent. 
And I think if that is going to be the, the question, they are more than prepared because almost uh, one half of the Asian continent were already under the Japanese. And they were very good. They made surgical uh, attacks in Pearl Harbor so that it will be paralyzed so that support will not enter the Philippines' premise. They have bombarded Clark Air Base and many other fundamental American military installations in the Philippines. So I think, uh, well, lo looking at the mastery of the terrain, knowing, of course, the art of having the proper weaponry system, the art of spying and the deception, propelled the Japanese people to become victorious po during their initial conquest of the Southeast Asian region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reto. Anything to add po, uh, Sir Domingo? I have nothing more to add. I mean, <laughs> all of them answered very well. Thank you very much po. And if that, uh, I think that's all of our questions for today. So that ends our open forum. Thank you, Thank you very much, everyone, for participating in our Q&A portion and for sending in your questions. Thank you very much to our research speakers as well for responding to our viewers' questions. As we now near the end of our program, let us have the administrator of Mount Samad Access, Mr. Francis Initorio, for his closing remarks. A pleasant afternoon to all. On behalf of the Mount Samad Flagship Tourism Enterprise Zone, TIEZA, I congratulate the Philippine Veterans Affairs Office under the Department of National Defense and its partner agencies, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and the Philippine Veterans Bank for the successful launching and opening of the 2022 Kagitingan webinar series. We also commend the academicians, scholars, and historians from the University of the Philippines, De La Salle University, University of Santo Tomas, and the Far Eastern University for your dedication to this virtual interactive education program. Your support to this long-term program is essential to raise the awareness of the Filipino youth about our shared responsibilities in honoring and remembering the heroic deeds of our veterans. Today, we have learned a great deal about the significance of the Philippines' political history and community before the Second World War. The topics discussed help us fathom some of the relationships of the Filipino nation in East Asia and its impact on the Philippine society and culture before the Great War. It gave us the opportunity to harness our historical research skills and to decode, critically evaluate, and contextualize the past and its effects on the consequent trends and developments. Moving forward, we aim to further tap the public interest in history as we continue to present in a nuanced manner the other 24 collective topics about the various unknown story of heroism and valor in the World War II. To the participants of today's learning sessions, thank you for taking time to join us. We look forward to sharing with you all the studies, researches, and stories that our organizers rigorously prepared for you. At this instance, I would like to assure the lead organizers, especially PIVAO, that the Mount Samat FTES is fully committed in supporting you in this endeavor. As part of the pre-veterans and post-veterans week activities, the Mount Samat FTES will continue to implement the Patriotism and Valor Communication Plan and prepare other educational programs alongside this webinar series. Again, Congratulations to everyone. 
let us all enjoy the Kagitingan webinar series. for your certificate of participation and you will receive your e-certificate after a day. Kindly check your spam folder in case it was sent there instead of your inbox. And for the next episode of our Kagitingan webinar lectures, here's our schedule. There you go. So this one is uh, with the theme, the American colonial period and the Japanese occupation. This will be on March 9, same time at 10 a.m. We will have Dr. Angelita Damilic, Dr. Jose Victor Z. Torres, Mr. Roman R. Sarmiento Jr., and Mr. Joselito Ebro. Hope, we hope to see all of you next week for this episode. Now, before we officially end our program, we will now have a photo op together with our resource speakers. So we are inviting all of our participants, our special guests, and of course our speakers. Please turn your cameras on. And we will have our Female representative, she will be. Okay, po. Sumay lang po tayong lahat. Okay, po. Next. Next. Next page. There you go. Next page. Okay, one more. Next page. Next page. Thank you very much. And that's it. Once again, thank you, participants. Thank you to our guests and thank you to our speakers. That concludes our today's episode of Kagiting and Historical Webinar Lectures. We thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and we hope to see you soon on the next one. I am Maria Maga Grace Sahagun. And I am Felicia Lanya. We have been your hosts for today. Thank you and good afternoon. Bye. -bye. Oh,